hotel. It's a lovely uh, rainy day here where I am. I'm not sure where you all are at, but hopefully uh, you're nice and warm. So um, today we're going to be talking about women in Hinduism. But as I sort of mentioned last week, um, now that we're encountering more specific um, and institutionalized world religions that have these vast histories, you kind of have to get like a crash course in just what the religion is before we can start really focusing in on how a particular religious tradition has viewed certain marginalized groups right throughout certain points in history. So with that, I want to take the first at least 15 to 20 minutes of class to make sure that I answer all your questions about Hinduism in general. Um, that's not to say that you can't ask questions about, uh, you know, how Hinduism has viewed certain groups, but I want to at least give us a chance to, you know, focus on the entire religious tradition and get a good grasp on that before we dive into more specifics. So as I mentioned again last week, um, I am covering these major, right, what are referred to in the text as major world religions in as close to chronological order as possible. And you'll know right off the bat why I say as close to as possible, because landing dates for the origins of any of these traditions can be very challenging, right? Um, and this particular tradition uh, in some cases is viewed as not even having an origin, right? As it's it's seen as an eternal tra uh, religious tradition, right? The oldest set of texts within Hinduism are considered eternal or authorless, right? In the sense that they've always existed. So they're not even ascribed a particular date of origin. So again, we're kind of, we're trying to be chronological order. And so we're going to one of the um, oldest or considered oldest traditions after the indigenous tradition uh, traditions that we looked at last week, right? So broad questions about Hinduism to start us off. You can raise your hand virtually. You have your camera on. You can raise your hand there. You can type your questions into the chat. Questions about Hinduism. It's gone through a couple couple different forms, right? So. We kind of demarcate those time periods in reference to the sacred text that was, you know, upheld the most at that time, right? So going back to the very beginning, that's the Vedas, right? Then we move on to the Upanishads, which is really just the last of the Vedas. And then we move into the Bhagavad Gita and the laws of Manu, which are going to be particularly relevant when we start talking about views of women. But if you want some of those frames of reference for your questions, we can talk about the, the structure, right, of the institution, who is considered to have authority, who isn't, the texts themselves. Excellent question. So before I answer it, um, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So is everyone clear on what the caste system refers to? Any confusion about that? Okay, good. So, um, you know, caste system more broadly used, right, could refer to any sort of hierarchical structure, right, that sort of solidifies people there, um, in their status in the sense that there's no like upward or downward mobility, um, at least within one lifetime, right? If we're talking about Hinduism, we're talking about reincarnation and multiple, right, rebirths. Um, so it, you can move between castes in a different lifetime, potentially, right? But right, it's seen that within any particular human life, there is no mobility. And so your question is a really important one because in one sense, women are in every caste, right? Because caste is determined by blood and by family, right? And then reinforced through marriage. So it, right, the idea is that in, in a sense, in a, in a pragmatic, obvious, explicit sense, no, right? We, it's not clear that all women are Shudras, right? Because women are demarcated by almost it's it comes to terms like we would see it as socioeconomic status right is really how we it appears today and so marrying within your class right or caste in that sense um women have to be at every level right to reinforce a heteronormative system right between males and females otherwise the structure of sexual relationships would look totally different so yeah in this obvious sense right women are throughout the caste system but yeah, so there's this interesting problem or inconsistency that we see, which is that in, pract in practice, right, it is not 
stated that women are only relegated to one caste. So where do we get this mis this message then that all women are shudras? Where is this coming from? Because it's not coming from practice, right? It's not coming from the culture. It's not coming from any explicit behavior or um, uh, statements, right, of fact. So where where does this idea come from? Because it's an excellent point. Um, and, you know, I didn't just make it up in my lecture. I, you know, right, this is coming from somewhere. So where is this idea coming from? And I see a couple other hands were up. So I, I'm not sure if that's to answer this question or to uh, ask another question. So Darwin, I see you um, for, for a future question, but let's focus on this for a moment. Where does this idea come from that we, all women are shudras or are belong to that lowest of castes since the there was a lower caste right does anyone know what the the previous lowest caste was called the untouchables is what it like translated to um and so this caste is not again explicitly in existence anymore even though again in practice right it definitely is in terms of discrimination um but so the shudra is now the lowest considered the lowest caste and so why where are we getting this idea that all women are belonging to this caste in some sense well let's start with a broader question then what determines what caste you belong to at all excellent and if any of you recall, this comes primarily from which text? Where do we get this talk of the, the Rajas, the Tamas, the Sattva is the other one, right? That that govern um, what in Hinduism we could call a soul, right? An immortal soul, which has a couple different ways, right? We have to talk about that in relationship to the divine. But, right, these forces that rule your soul, where, which text do we uh, get this this idea from primarily? I can ask you then what is it part of the Mahabharata, right, which is even the larger text, which is um, an epic poem, right, and so the Bhagavad Gita is one part of the what is considered the longest um, epic poem uh, written that we have uh, an accounting of in history, um, and it's 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 quite beautifully done if, if you like poetry, right, reading texts in this way, um, but it's very symbolic, right, in its language, right? And so, yeah, we have a lot of metaphors and stories that are used to convey stories um, and messages. And this one is coming during a great battle, right, that's taking place. And the primary protagonists, right, are um, Krishna and Arjuna, one of whom is the chariot driver, and the other is the charioteer, right, the one who does the, who's the archer, who, right, is in the back of the chariot and is going to be doing the fighting in the battle. Um, and this is all important because, of course, these people are not just who, who they are in their roles, right? One of these figures ends up being an incarnation of um, one aspect of Brahman, the divine being, uh, particularly um, the aspect known as uh, Vishnu, right? And so each aspect of Brahman has a different function. And so Vishnu is what? What? What is Vishnu responsible for when we look at the Trimurti in Hinduism? All these conceptions of the divine have a different function. Molly? Uh, Vishnu is the preserver. Good, right? So that's already important because we're on a battlefield, right? About to enter, uh, obviously, like a situation that's going to involve killing and the ending of life. But we don't have Shiva, the destroyer, right? who's being reincarnated. So there's, right, there's symbolism in all of these details, right? And so there, that's meant to be part of the, the story, right? The, the moral that, that one is supposed to take away from it, the lessons. Um, so in terms of caste, right, why is this relevant? Well, because in order to resolve the situation in which um, Arjuna is struggling with his duty as a warrior, he doesn't want to have to go kill what are, in fact, um, you know, distant cousins, right, uh, members of his own blood, right? So he's struggling between uh, different moral imperatives that he feels he has as a warrior, right, to protect what is good versus, you know, not killing people that are in your family, right? That's, we think of that as a bad thing, usually, right? Hopefully that intuition is shared. Uh, killing anybody, hopefully, right? We, we have strong intuitions against that, but especially people we're close to. 
Um, and so part of this dialogue between Arjuna and the embodiment of Vishnu is actually to encourage Arjuna to what? To, to what? Drop? drop his weapons and leave the battlefield or to go and fight Who can remember what the message is in the Bhagavad Gita. I think what does the divine tell tell this warrior to do? Am I going to have to call on someone? Ooh. All right, it's going to happen soon. I don't see a hand. We answered in the chat. Yay, thank you. Ruben, drop the weapons. Good. And why is that? Why uh, would... No, that's not what the divine being is going to say. Drop the weapons. That sounds right. It sounds like what a divine being would do, right? Wouldn't we... Cons we typically think of gods as being right these all good beings and like i just said we have the strong intuition that killing people is wrong but that's actually not what vishnu's advice is vishnu vishnu encourages arjuna to go and fight and do his duty as a warrior so is that a is that a condonement of violence why is why is a divine being encouraging this, a warrior to not drop the weapons, but to go and to kill? Think of it in terms of the caste system, what you have learned about that, Molly, right? So warrior class, right, is actually one of the castes, right? And it's a very important one. Right, serves a very important function. And the idea is that if you were born into that caste, right, you were born into it for a reason. And on the flip side of that, in terms of right, Hindu conceptions of rebirth, reincarnation, right, an eternal soul, one of the points that um, the embodiment of Vishnu makes in the form of Krishna is that you think you're about to go kill someone. But what is it really? That's just part of Maya. That's part of the illusion, right? The truth of Brahman, right? The ultimate reality is that there is no life and death, right? There is no coming into being and going out of being, right? There, all of these things are part of the transient, ever-changing nature of Maya, the illusory reality that we're in, right? And so to be caught up in, in that um, as if it were permanent, right? The mistake is to think that life or death is permanent. They're always temporary, whichever one, right? To get caught up in that, that is the mistake, right? And so Arjuna is not uh, only, right, fulfilling his dharma, but those other people who in the story represent like an evil sort of um, group, they uh, engaged in what was considered unjust warfare on other neighboring towns and enslaved their uh, the people that they captured, right? So they also are getting the, the seeds or the fruits of their own karma, right? They brought these actions upon themselves, right, in the story. And so the idea is that, you know, if, if you're not going to do it, that's not going to stop it from happening, right? <laughs> right? These things are all set into motion. They're already they're already occurring. Um, so you can try to fight against it all you want. But again, you're fighting against something that is not just inevitable in the sense of cause and effect, but is also not permanent, right? It's going to be changing every now and again. So here we have, so fighting would make that person be a part of a lower no so actually if by fulfilling one's dharma right you're fulfilling what your duty and so then there's the question of you know what is going to contribute to better or worse karma right and there are many realms in which you can be reborn in into the in the hindu cosmology right the human realm is just one of them so not everyone is reborn as another human right but the human birth is important because it's the only one in which you can accumulate karma, right? So the way I understand this is like if you accumulated bad 
negative karmic points, right? Whatever, however you want to quantify it as a human. And let's say I'm going to be reborn as a worm in the next life, right? That's like a timeout. I don't get to accumulate good karma as a worm, right? <laughs> like that's just, I just have to kind of do my time until I am reborn again in human form and can achieve or earn, right? Better or more positive karmic points. And there are higher realms of birth than being born as a human even, right? So there are some, um, he they're quite heavenly realms, right? Full of, right, sort of spirit ephemeral um, entities that don't suffer the way that humans do, right? So that might be like a reward, a little time off, like a, I don't know, like a spa getaway, but you know, like a little break from the, <laughs> the troubles of, of human life for a little bit, right? But Again, the ultimate goal here is not to be reborn again and again, right? Because again, it's all temporary. Nothing is permanent, even these, these many lives. So the goal is to leave that. So you fulfill your karma. You earn good karmic points by fulfilling the function of your caste, right? The, the, the spot in society that not only are your skills best suited to, right? But that will have the ideas that by serving part of that larger function, you're contributing, right, more positive effects to the larger circle of samsara, right, that wheel, that cosmic turning, right? And so by doing that, you are at least moving towards higher castes, if not higher planes of existence, but eventually the idea is to achieve what? What's the ultimate goal in Hinduism? Close with an an O, moksha, moksha, very good. And we're going to see um, in Buddhism coming up um, a similar idea, but very different, known as nirvana. Right. So both of these are going to involve leaving the the cycle of death and rebirth, samsara. But the difference is that in Hinduism we are actually leaving Maya altogether and being reabsorbed into what? What is that ultimate reality again? in Hinduism? Brahman. Brahman. Good. Right. And um, Brahman is tied to a particular part of each of us. Um, so if you like, if you like more visual metaphors, get ready, because I got a lot. All right. So the first one is like a puzzle. Okay. So imagine Brahman is like an infinite puzzle. Okay. And we can imagine that puzzle having an infinite number of pieces. Right. So at various points in time, X number of puzzle pieces are in samsara, right? In various stages of death and rebirth. You have a piece of Brahman in you, right? Each of us has one, as well as all living things, right? And entities in these other realms. And so the idea is that, again, eventually the puzzle piece wants to rejoin the puzzle, right? And so it's not that like everyone is a god, right? That's often a, a misconception of this, right? We're not saying that everyone has a god in you, right? Or something like this, but that there is a, the part of you that is eternal, the one part of you that is not subject to the temporality of Maya, right? This constant flow of things changing, coming and going, living and dying, blah, blah, blah right? Always changing. If there's one part of you that is not subject to that is the part of you that comes from Brahman, right? And so that would be the equivalent of what we might call an immortal soul. But this is why all of this is coming back to Molly's excellent question, right? Why are women in considered in, to be all shudras? Right? Well, so we have this part of Brahman that's in you. And what do we call that? That part of Brahman that is in you, your true self, and sometimes referred to as that. And then the part of Brahman that is in you is Atman, right? But that Atman is going to take many different forms and many different lives, right? Um, so in this particular life, right, my Atman is in a female form, right? And so it's going to take on certain personality traits based on that embodiment. And so that personality is going to be called my jiva, right? So we're getting all these layers here. So you got Brahman, right? The part of Brahman that is in you, which is Atman. Again, and here's comes another metaphor, right? Uh, like a coat rack, <laughs> right? Atman is the coat rack and your jiva are like the different coats it puts on, right? Different lifetimes, different personalities, right? Different outfits, Okay. Your jiva is what is governed by the gunas, 
okay, by these forces that you have to different amounts or quantities, depending on, as my Molly rightly pointed out, the karma you, you accumulated in a previous life, right? So what that means is that, right, based on your actions, you're going to have certain a certain jiva, a certain personality trait that you're predisposed to, okay, in life. And that's also going to determine what caste you end up being born into and thus your skill set, right? And so all of these things are sort of predetermined in a way, which means that if you are born in that, right, it's sort of self-justifying. You don't need to prove it necessarily on top of that, that you have these skills. It's sort of proven by your very existence. And these jivas, right, again, reflect what you quote unquote deserve, right, your just desserts from whatever actions were taken, right, by your Atman in a previous life. And so if you are born into a lower caste, right, it's not seen as unfair, right, that's karmic justice, right, that's seen as what you deserved. And we can see this manifest even in the West, right, in views that people who are more wealthy or not, right, um, that they deserve it in some way, right, that it somehow mean, is a marker of them being better people, right, having better luck, even if they want to chalk it up to that, right, that, that it's somehow because of or tied to, can you not hear me? Okay. Sorry, Darwin, I hope you can hear me. So talking about how the karma that we accumulate is part of the considered justice, right? Fairness. And so it's right or deserved. And so to make a difference between what governs the different uh, types of human beings, right? And historically, again, we classify human beings in a, in a, a binary manner, right? Males and females, even that, even though that does not map onto actual human biology, right? There are many more ways of categorizing, right, people's uh, biological sex than that. But historically, those have been the pr two predominant categories. And so one way to account for those differences, right, is with the same system, right? The same system of your jiva and the, the gunas, the forces that govern it, right? And so as is pointed out and is reinforced by the caste system, the primary difference attributed to males versus females, as we've seen, tends to go along lines of being reasonable versus being unreasonable. Well, that just happens to map on to one of the gunas, right? Sattva is the guna of intelligence, right? And wisdom, okay? So if only one group can have uh, a predominance of those categories, right? Well, it's probably not going to be women historically, right? Being get considered to be the most wise. Um, and in particular, they're not seen as or attributed to as having great physical strength either. So they're not going to be great in the middle of the caste system, right? As warriors, um, and probably not even considered to be uh, wise or smart enough to to run a business or something like this, right? So this relegates them to the lowest caste, right? Being seen as ruled by, right? Excuse me, Thomas or the guna of ignorance, right? And so by the mere fact that one is born a biological female, that signifies what about your karma? Yeah. So we're all being punished. <laughs> we all did something bad in a previous life just by virtue of our, right? That is how deep this goes. And to see it in practice, right? Again, it's ameliorated through the fact that women in practical aspects have to be part of every caste. But um, there were some remarkable statistics about uh, unmarried women, regardless of their caste, right? Um, and regardless of their family backgrounds, unless they're able to get some sort of, you know, uh, special connection, single women are charged more in rent and it's considered a morality deposit, right? So like the way you put down a security deposit, women have to put down a morality deposit when they don't have men to co-sign, right? Or be on the uh, financial documents, right? We, we've seen this in the U.S., as not far back as the 80s, right? Um, in terms of 
women not being able to open a credit card without a man co-signing it, right? Things like this. But the idea is that the, right, the mere fact that one is a woman is somehow a marker of your moral character. So we see this deeply intertwined, right, within the caste system. Um, and so that's where we get this message from, right, from this karmic story about how this cycle of samsara operates um, and where people go based on what type of actions they've done and why that's considered just. So that was a long question, but we covered a lot in there. So it's all right. Good. And so hopefully you're already starting to see some inconsistencies, right? Which is what this class is going to be about, right? Teaching you how to find those things, right? So we have already an inconsistency between the way uh, the caste system is put into practice and the actual teachings themselves. But there's also this inconsistency within the teachings, right? Because, um, and you saw this, hopefully, if you got a chance to read uh, the um, Vanita, the self is not gendered, right? So this story about um, an ascetic woman. So an ascetic at this time is someone who has taken a vow of um, like extreme simplicity, like uh, basically going without, right? Um, not engaging in any sort of creature comfort. So taking a life of poverty, right? Um, and things like this. So this way of life is considered very difficult, right? And so it was not something that women were historically uh, permitted to do, right? Or considered capable of doing. And so this king uh, in the story who considers himself to be, you know, quite wise and in fact thinks he's pretty enlightened himself, um, he makes a mistake, right? That goes against one of these primary teachings. So we have on the one hand, this idea that if you're born a woman, it's because there's something wrong, right, with your karma, and so you deserve to be punished. And so the the way, right, that society is going to treat you is going to be based on your caste and on your gender. But what other teaching does that go against in Hinduism? It's pointed out in this story. It's another inconsistency we have here. So looking at, again, the teaching that we people are going to be treated differently, right, in practice based on their caste, and that that's all somehow justified, what other teaching in Hinduism does that go against? All right, so if we remember back to our little system, right, our metaphysical system, we have Brahman, right, Atman, and then Jiva, which is just the personality traits that are temporary, right? So that would include your gender too, right? Your biological sex, those are parts of your Jiva, they're just temporary. They're just part of this individual life. So is it a mark of someone who is enlightened that they would treat someone based on their jiva? Mm, no, right? Okay, so here's another potential inconsistency, right? We have this like really significant part of the teachings, right, that are reinforced in the Bhagavad Gita about the caste system and the gunas and the forces that govern our, our souls and why we're in the positions that we're in, why we deserve them, right? Why this is all justified and how it ought to be. But then on the other hand, right, is the idea that again, that's just all part of Maya, right? And that's part of the illusion that an enlightened person is meant to overcome, right? And so that's what's being demonstrated in this story where we have a king who, right, believes he's enlightened because he's reinforcing the caste system, right? Because that's what the teachings dictate. And you have this woman who is pointing out that his being hung up on the fact that she's a woman, right? The fact that she's breaking the norms of the cat of society, right? That these are in fact all markers of ignorance, right? That ignorance that we want to shed, okay? So again, why is this important? 
when we're trying to uncover potential problems for a specific group, right, from a particular religious tradition, it's going to be important to unpack where those problems are coming from, right? And remember, this could be in terms of whether it's coming from the religion at all, right, or a cultural practice, or looking at different aspects of the religion. And in this case, we have a clear distinction between different sets of texts, right? We have the Vedas and the Upanishads, which emphasize um, Brahman and Atman, and those ideas are carried into the Bhagavad Gita, right? But elements of the Bhagavad Gita also focus on how we get wrapped up on everything in Maya, right? And so learning to pull those teachings apart, right? Realize, well, okay, that's just explaining how things are here. That doesn't mean it's how it ought to be, right? Or how we should continue to reinforce it as, right? Learning if we're truly trying to achieve enlightenment or moksha, right? We need to see beyond those illusions, the illusory categories, right, that we put on people. So this is, again, one of those potential avenues for someone who's looking to remain within an institution and resolve the potential issues here, right, um, with the way women have been viewed. Okay, right, more questions. Uh, let me, actually, uh, Darwin, you had your hand up earlier, so I'm gonna go to you if you still have your question. Good. No, this is good. And this gets to the other reading that we had from uh, Tuesday, um, the gender complementarity, uh, right? The idea that genders, different genders complement each other, but then there being a hierarchy, right? And this has to go with other associations, right? So it, we were just talking about associations between, uh, you know, the male and female binary and reason and intelligence, right? And strength. The other side of that that we talked a little bit about last week is the association between nature, right, and femininity, right, and particularly the power of creation, right, which is often prescribed primarily to women, okay, and so we have this sort of idea that while there is a hierarchy and women are placed, right, in a subservient role, primarily to males in their lives, that doesn't mean that they're with that they're not without their role, right? Or their function. So what what do we know about the the woman's function um, according to the Hindu tradition or that's reinforced in uh in the cultures where Hinduism is practiced? What is the role of women? So yeah, there are different ways of talking about it. Sometimes it's referred to as the private sphere or the domestic sphere right, referring to what happens inside the home, even if the man is the head of the household. Um, what's that line from, I don't know, this is like an old reference now, but if you guys have seen my big fat Greek wedding, right, the man may be the head, but the woman is the neck. She turns the head whatever way she wants, right? There's something, there's something to this in the sense that because women are primarily uh, given the domain in the home that has to do with child rearing, right? that there is something that they have to do in order to be good mothers, right? Which is that they themselves have to be good people, right? And try to cultivate good morals, which is again, sort of antithetical to the idea of what it means to be a woman, right? If you take those stereotypes, right? We're considered not intelligent enough to, to make moral decisions, right? Or to be good in and of ourselves, but, but we're responsible for teaching the kids how to be moral, right? <laughs> And so um, there's this interesting sort of dynamic about who is responsible for whom in the family. And even though the women are in a dependent role, right, the responsibility doesn't necessarily go both ways in the way we're going to see, like, in Chinese cultures coming up right, where even the person in a hierarchical position is seen as having responsibilities to their subordinate. Um, there are conditions under which in Chinese culture you can get rid of those obligations, and they're terrible, of course, right? <laughs> but um, those initial presumptions of responsibility in some cases don't even exist, right, in the cases that we're talking about, um, in the sense that, like, mothers are going to have responsibilities to listen to their sons, but sons are not going to have really any of the sorts of moral responsibilities we're probably thinking of in 
relationship to their mother, right? And this especially includes uh, financial responsibility, right? Because the idea is that um, they're already going to be responsible for their future wife, right? And taking, right, women are seen as sort of a financial burden, right? Um, that you have to, right? If Since they're not able to contribute, right, to the financial well-being of the household, not allowed to, really. Then, right, they're considered another mouth to feed. And then when they have right, many mouths to feed. And so that sort of um, responsibility, just it's not going both ways, right, in the hierarchy, um, which makes sense, right, when you think about the, the different status. But that's not always the case, right? In some cases, we see um, a little bit more of a counter responsibility for the, the more privileged party, but not in this case. Yeah, and this is where we get into issues like the dowry deaths. Right. Um, and uh, the act of uh, sati. Right. So um, the expectation of a widow to throw herself on the funeral pyre, the right, the cremation of um, of her dead spouse. Right. So as not to be a burden to the kids. Right. That is the expectation in this case. So so our mothers at fault if their sons are a bad. Oh, definitely. Right. So mothers are always going to be held responsible for the the moral um, character of their of their children, even with the sons are. Yes. Yes. Right. Because the idea is that they were in the care of their mother until they reached an age to care for themselves. And so it, it will be the, considered the mother's fault um, in the same way that right when we are dealing with like two parents who are working, we still tend to hold them to different standards. Right. About you know, who who should be with the kids and, you know, who it harms to have less contact with. A lot of people still presume that, like, it's more harmful for a child to lose contact with their mother than, their, like, a lot of people still have this intuition, right, that there's something special in the development of the child um, having to do with the mother, right, that, that particular maternal bond, that it's particularly important, which, again, I if I was a father, I would feel a little insulted by that, right? Like <laughs> that you're not as significant to your child's development, right? So again, right there are flip sides to this. Yeah, good questions. So does that answer Blaine a little bit? I mean, it's it's just an explanation. It's not really an answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's just so it's strange, just... but that's also my internal biases and viewing from a Western perspective. Yeah, and you know, I I want to be charitable because in the you know, in terms of like comparing Western culture to other parts of the world, you know, we're very individualistic and we do not take care of our elderly. So like we are in no place to judge, right? No position to judge. Um, but yeah, right. Think of it in terms of like, yeah, how would you feel if someone was like, you know, I've got a parent who is you know reaching the age where they're unable to care for themselves. I'm not in a financial position to care for them, right? And so they put them in a nursing home or I know people who are perpetually booking their um, retired parents on cruises because it's cheaper than <laughs> a nursing home, right? Um, right, so like, you know, if we think that's okay, right? I just think cultures hold wives responsible for the health of their husbands, right? So right even if a, a husband has a problem that is entirely their own let's say it's you know substance abuse or whatever right we still tend to hold the wife responsible for that um I, I see it happen with my friends all the time right their their parents and their family why did you let them have another drink and why didn't you do it's like what they can't con why did you let him out we let him out it, like well, one is making this exact point right which is that this is another inconsistency, right? On the one hand, we are um, not ascribing responsibility to women, right? We're putting in this, them in this subordinated role, but then blaming them when things go wrong. Um, and this, is, this happens in a lot of other cases, again, just with traditional gender stereotypes. Like if you wanna look back at the history of humanity and say that women haven't been as intelligent as men, it's probably because you didn't allow them to be educated the way you educated, right? Like you're 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 keeping them in a position and then blaming them for the position you put them in, right? And then for being that way. It's the same thing when, right, we hold up this idea that women are supposed to be like super sexually attractive, but then the moment they get married, you're not supposed to be attractive to anyone else anymore, right? You just got to shut that down and be something. Like we don't teach women the skills, but then we hold them to these standards 
right? For which they we prohibited them from being able to do it. Yeah, good. So if women are supposed to entirely submit to their husbands, how are they supposed to make sure they can, exactly? Oh, never, right? A woman caring for herself is selfish, right? That's bad. That's that's historically real bad. <laughs> but again, this is hypocritical because if you know anything about the way the human body works, like you can't give infinitely to others without taking care of yourself, right? That's not how care works. Care is finite. Like we do not have this infinite ability to be there for everyone else and not ever take care of oneself, right? And so this is, yeah, good, good. Darwin question and brings up um, the other sort of myth or narrative that we need to talk about, um, which is that other part of the Pinchman paper, those those cosmogenies, right? The stories of creation and how they use sex metaphor, right? To describe how the universe was created. And it's the metaphor is um, a plant or a, a field receiving a seed. It's very subtle, <laughs> right? The sex metaphor, right? And so, right, who, the seed is obviously meant to represent the life force. And so the seed comes from the man, of course, right? <laughs> and the seed is active, right? And the field is passive and just receives the seed, right? So all of this super problematic language, right, um, that could definitely be used to reinforce rape culture, right? Um, but we get this other sort of potential problem here, which is that the way the process of reproduction is described is in terms of these active and passive forces. And so it is a, an absolutely a hypocritical point to both describe the female as the, as the con literally described as the container, right? Which receives the seed, right? But of course, once the seed is planted, nourishing of the soil is necessary. And that's where the blaming of the woman could come in. So even though she is a passive field receiving, oh God, I just can't even. <laughs> uh, the idea is that still there is nourishing that happens. And so there are all sorts of interesting, we call them like old wives tales. Again, there's a like a gendered der derogatory word to even those, that wording, right? Like if they're old wives tales, they're not true, right? <laughs> then they're lies or something, right? So yeah, we need better language for that. But there are these ideas that certain types of um, environments that you keep a fetus in, right, will increase the likelihood of that fetus developing into a male or a female, right? And um, this is not total. again, just like we're going to see other precursors. We talked about this in terms of like witchcraft, but we're going to see other precursors that seem sort of mystical or magical that are really just precursors to science, right? So we do know that um, certain types of hormones, uh, I think temperature used to be a big one, like hot, depending on if you keep your belt hot or cold, like there are all sorts of interesting things. And I I don't know enough about fetal devel development to know which ones have an effect more than hormones. Um, but there is some some evidence to suggest that, you know, certain environmental factors could change the probability, right? So it's not totally, um, you know, ridiculous to think that there's no way of impacting that. Um, but it seems a bit much to expect someone to be responsible for that. But of course, as we know, right, women have been res held responsible for having male heirs and our punishment have been punished for not having them throughout, throughout uh, documented human history. Brahmas. So it's very yeah. obviously the word itself is very close. And that's good. And so right here, there's a similar idea of uh, in the chat here, right? Um, if a woman birds a son, wouldn't that be proof that she has good karma, right? and that she shouldn't be karmically punished. So again, the way you're born is gonna be an effect of previous life karma, right? So it's not like, uh, this is one uh, common Western misconception of karma, which is that like, it happens in your immediate life, right? Like that you go and do something bad and like tomorrow you're gonna reap the negative karma. Like that's not how it works, <laughs> right? Uh, that, that That's far too easy to debunk because obviously people do all kinds of terrible things and are, you know, rewarded greatly in the world, <laughs> right? In their lifetime. So this is something that it, one wouldn't, right? You don't necessarily have evidence for until the future life. But yeah, if you, depending on, um, 
what how what kind of children you have right the this if the sex is going to be indicative of of your status absolutely it's going to be seen as punishment for previous life bad karma if you have you know give birth to to lots of girls and of course if you give birth to a son or lots of sons right then it's seen as a reward and so maybe the question is like so would it would it make sense because you both punished someone by making them be reborn as a woman and then rewarded them also with a son, right? And someone might just say, well, that's how karma works, right? It's not just one thing, right? There are lots of different elements. It's not that someone is just rewarded or just punished, right? Um, life is a mixed bag, right? And so most of us are going to get many different types of punishments and many different types of rewards, right? And so you might have to look at the entire lifetime uh, to decide, you know, whether or not someone is getting any closer to uh, enlightenment, right? But the idea is that if you are moving up the cast, that is supposed to be a signifier of moving towards enlightenment again, which doesn't say good things about women. <laughs> yeah, so there is a question about like fault, which is interesting. And oh yeah, time is up. I'm sorry for those of you who have to go. This is so much fun, but I'll see you all next week if you have to go. Um, but yeah, so it's hard to like say that it's someone's fault because the idea is that the karma probably follows the the Atman, right? But yeah, it's hard. Some people have tried to make a science of like trying to trace causal effects, like who was reborn from whom. That that gets a that gets a little bit too far away from empirical evidence for me to say anything about. Um, but there are some interesting interesting studies about like past life experience and things like that that have tried to confirm this. Um, but you wouldn't be able to say it was anyone's fault unless you were able to make that causal connection, right? Which is hard to do between lifetimes. So. I'm skeptical on whether or not that can be done. <laughs> Although I'm sure many people want to, right? And do blame people all the time. So you're picking up on a really important point, which is why we're gonna be covering Buddhism next because it emerges out of Hinduism. And it's gonna have a lot of really important similarities, but also a lot of really important differences. And uh, Siddhartha Gautama's criticism of the caste system is absolutely gonna be at the heart of that, right? And that's going to be as a direct result of his experience from, having come from such a privileged background, right? Indeed. And then this sort of, um, uh, as the story goes, a very significant event, right? That changed that for him. But um, yeah, so trace those, right? And see see how they evolve in the Buddhist tradition. And also because Buddhism is going to um, spread to different parts of the world, we're going to see it evolve in different ways than Hinduism involved, right? Um, oh, hello, cattail. Uh, specifically right in the move um from china to japan right and getting into more zen buddhism uh there's it's going to pick up on a lot of um what were indigenous uh asian cultures right at the time and so mm. bring in so buddhism starts off coming from a religion with many gods right hinduism has this like ginormous pantheon even though they're all part of one ultimate reality buddhism starts off with no divine beings but then as it as it evolves, it ends up also end up having a lot of divine entities, right? So tracing that in the class, we'll talk about it mm -hmm. more next week. <laughs> and actually, maybe you can bring this up uh, next week, because this is something that we are going to see continued in the Buddhist tradition. Um, so even though Buddhism has a little more gender equality, it does not have gender equality the way that we want to think it does. And it's because we get these stories, right? throughout the various texts, like the one you're referring to, right? Which is that um, women's honor and virtue, right? The things that we are supposed to cultivate to achieve enlightenment are upheld through self-sacrifice, right? That our lives are not as important as our sexual purity, right? And our virtue. Yeah. And that's really, really, really problematic because men don't, always they don't always get those messages right it tends to be again relegated to their function in society right that might be the call for warriors right to potentially put their life on the line 
But that's certainly not the case for everyone, right? And the elites, we see lots of stories of men exhibiting great cunning to get out, right, to save their lives. Um, and that doesn't impede their virtue in any sort of way. <laughs> yeah. Point to bring up, because again, we, we see these sorts of ideas replicated elsewhere, right? That um, perhaps, you know, it's better for a woman to end her own life than to be sexually assaulted, right? Um, yeah. A very real and primal fear, right? Um, and, right, what that does to survivors, right? Basically, like, making them always wonder, like, should I have just done something else, right? Like, rather yeah. than live with this and the stigma, right? Like, makes it worse. So, yeah, no, there are there are huge ramifications from those narratives, especially because, yeah, they're often portrayed very romantically, right? Very idealistically. I mean, we have them, right? We This is a problem with Shakespeare. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a pretty clear message, right? Like, it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really frustrating. Um, especially when you're dealing, right, with this deeply intertwined system, right, of culture and religion and history. And it's why these problems are so insidious, right? And why they're so difficult to tackle, because they run so deep across so many different ideological channels. Right. That yeah. I, oh, I resign myself to like, well, let's just learn about it. <laughs> yeah, Safety. Also, house. right. Like that, those kinds of decisions, they come out of fear. Like Absolutely, in my experience, yeah. it's really understandable. Right. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, how, how do we move past that? Right. Yeah. And that's the thing is that these, these things are often done to girls and young women for their own good. Right. Like fear of, of men and strangers and, you know, in, in many ways that really messed with me. And in other ways, like, I'm so glad that they did because I, you know, I see other people not be as conscientious about their surroundings. And I'm like, like, I see that as danger, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So but... yes, and this is going to be something that is really going to hit home when we uh, get to Islam, because that is the specific justification given for veiling. It's not women's yeah. fault, right? It's that men can't control themselves. And instead of that onus being put on the men, it just gets put on us. And again, just to give you a contemporary example, I see the same thing with, you know, oh, women, you need to take self-defense classes, yeah. right? Like, protecting yourself because we're not going to teach boys to stop attacking you, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, um, I, I obviously always lose track of time because I could talk about this stuff forever. So thank you yeah. for your participation yeah. today. I'll have a great weekend. I'll see you next